Hi, my name is Ray Salemi, and I am the Aerospace and Defense Solutions Manager for Siemens EDA DVT division that brings you Questa and the other verification tools. Today we're going to go a little bit far afield from IC verification and talk about changes in the overall defense industry and changes that will eventually affect us in the way we develop ICs. And that's all based on the digital thread which is a new methodology for designing uh, aircraft and other defense projects. The initiative was created and spearheaded by Dr. Will Roper, who was the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for acquisition when he wrote the paper, There Is No Spoon, which put forth the ideas here that will um, change the way we design and build airplanes. And the idea is to go faster than we are now. We're, we're simply taking too long to design a plane and get it out. D Dr. Roper wants to accelerate the process dramatically. In fact, he believes that unless we can accelerate the process, that we're going to fall behind competitors such as China, who have more engineers to apply to defense work. He's looked in and created this the idea of the digital holy trinity, which are three elements of design that he believes will revolutionize the way we go forward with design in aerospace and defense. The first is digital engineering, which is model-based systems engineering, and we'll see a lot of that in this presentation about using simulation to understand what we're building in detail before we build it, and only that, how we'll build it and, and how quickly we can build it. The digital engineering gives us access to agile development, which allows teams to iterate quickly on a, a working design and improve it uh, through each loop through the iteration. And all of that is held together with open architecture based on cloud-based computing and open, an open access across organizations to the same set of development tools. Now, Siemens has been working with the uh, Air Force and with the Navy to bring this to fruition and pull this together, to create a digital backbone that would be used across projects. And here are some of the projects that it's worked on, the, the TX Trainer, the ground-based strategic defense system, uh, submarines, tankers, bombers, all of these types of elements are coming together you, with the Air Force and the Navy working with Siemens using the accelerator. Uh, Siemens is chosen for this work because it is a trusted name across of all of aerospace and defense, providing uh, services across the whole range from mechanical CAD through ECAD and simulation. And then, importantly here, we'll see PLM. In fact, uh, the Air Force has uh, mandated that w projects working with the Air Force are going to use Team Center as the PLM center for the project, and we'll see why in the next slides. Uh, and then, so unless they can get a waiver, they'll be working with Team Center, and so... Uh, so will we. So the concept of the digital twin and the digital thread are related. A digital twin is a uh, something we're very comfortable with in IC design. It's a model of a real device. Now in our world we use RTL to model chips. In the um, air, aerospace world we use broader simulation tools and more physical simulation tools. And we create this virtual product, which is what the plane characteristics are gonna be and how it's gonna be shaped. And we can use that to start to show how we would build such a thing and create a virtual production line. This is how the parts will fit together and where they'll fit together. And then we iterate back and forth between those two, making this through the agile process, making the plane better and better until it's ready to go to real production. And at that point, we automate the factory and make a digital twin of the factory, make sure that the assembly lines are, are, uh, are balanced and that the, the system can move forward that way. And then finally, when we uh, ship the plane, we have a digital twin of the real plane, and we're using that to track defects and to track uh, customer support issues and service issues and feed those things that we learn back all the way to the beginning of the process so, so as to improve later iterations of the same aircraft. Now, until now, we've had this sort of a, a picture where you have the Department of Defense that's going to define what it needs to be built and then the, the industry that supports it. 
and there's a gap between the two. The defense is over here and the industry is there, and there are these milestones that we've had for decades that go through all of the process steps uh, to build a plane. And two of the ones we're going to look at are the program award and program delivery. Those are the two, two uh, that people note the most in the press, for example. And so, uh, and so if we think about this process, you know, it, it's two organizations taking the intelligence that they have in their organizations and dumbing it down to uh, paper, give, giving paper back and forth, uh, or in uh, you know, more modern times, PDFs, but still paper. And so this, this is uh, the state of affairs uh, up until recently. And so about six years ago, the Department of Defense started to say, well, we need to start to use a PLM system for this. And they said that data would have to be delivered in PDM XML, which works with Team Center. Now, if we look at what's happening, you, you have a, if you think about a project, you know, it starts out in the Department of Defense with them defining the project and then goes, once the program's awarded, it goes into the industry. So the, the Department of Defense is doing the requirements and the systems engineering and, and what are the alternatives that it has. Meanwhile, passing paper back and forth from the industry to, to iterate on the process. And then once the program is awarded, you have uh, requirements management, design, simulation, and this is following multiple tracks as the program is built and delivered. And again, paper, 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 and eventually an airplane. Meanwhile, while one side is actively working on the project, the other side is doing shadow work. When the project is being defined, the industry is trying to help guide it to where they can build it. And uh, while it's being designed and built, the government is watching and providing oversight for the project. And again, paper, paper, paper going back and forth. That's what we want to get rid of with Team Center and with the Accelerator, is we create one unified system across two organizations where we're no longer passing paper back and forth, we're passing back and forth models and the original design data. And that allows us to take this process and shrink it. And so we have the program award happens faster and the program delivery happens faster. We've had planes now with this system be delivered and built in 18 months. And it's an agile system. So this plane delivered in 18 months is the first iteration of the plane. It flies, but then you can start to add ordnance onto it. You can start to add other systems onto it. But you now have a, something to work with and, and models to, to build upon. If we think about how this process works, there's still a lot of steps. But the steps are now part of an organized flow between two organizations. And they they don't have to send paper back and forth. They're all looking at the same database and they're all looking at the same data. And you don't have to do this with one partner. If you're going through this process with one partner, you could be going through this process with, a, with another partner, if you're the DOD, and find out who is going to deliver you the best plane, or a third. Or you can say, maybe take another partner and use them for fielding the, the plane. So you, you now have a flexibility to multiple projects, multiple partners across multiple phases, all because everybody is using a centralized database system to hold design data. So let's look at a demo, so to speak, of this process. So we're going to say, let's say there's a project, and uh, we need this project, and, and how would that work? Well, you think about what would this project be? This, is, uh, this project is... The fact that we have soldiers who are in areas with IEDs and we want to have something, something that flies, an airplane or a helicopter, and looks for IEDs. And as it, as it flies along, it has sensors that recognize IEDs. It can send back locations and requests to take them out. And then it can take the IEDs out before the trucks roll by, either in this case with a super cool laser uh, or maybe with simply a missile. But this is the, this is the basic idea of what, what the DOD wants. So how, how, do, how does this start? How does this ha happen? So let's look at this process again. We're going to look at each step in a little, see a little demo of how each step of this works. You know, right at the beginning, we're doing requirements engineering. And this is, this is critical. Um, mistakes that are made at this early st stage that don't get caught 
are hugely expensive. They, they completely change the architecture of the following designs. They may create uh, bottlenecks in materials or bottlenecks in manufacturing. Things way back at the beginning here that are not fully understood can wreak havoc with the rest of the project. And so here we are taking uh, th these requirements and decomposing them so as to get some sense of uh, how these requirements will get turned into a design uh, before we move on to the next step. There are going to be multiple ways that one can solve a problem. So we can use these alternatives, like that aerial platform. We don't know if it's a plane or a helicopter, but we know what it should be able to do. And we can put what it should be able to do into functional models that show us whether the system that we're thinking of can even work. And if it can't work, we can now iterate online early on uh, before we start to get the industry involved in, def in defining well, what's physically able to be done. So this now we have this model the, the, of what we want, and now the industry can get involved in beginning to shape it. You know, before there's even a, a, um, an award made, uh, the industry can be showing different ways, different physical ways that the design could be put together, and what are the capabilities of the real world to implement what up until this point was a, a theoretical model. And so the an industry passes these back to the DOD again through a, a, a system that they are working in together, and the DOD can now look at, uh, at what the alternatives are for that. And so when you get to the analysis of alternatives here in the award program, Right? You can look at different bidders and how close they are to what you need and whether or not their, their design is too expensive or too hard to build or too hard to maintain. All of this can be simulated up front. And you can look at bidder 1, bidder 2, bidder 3. Here's the helicopter design that, it, that turns out doesn't make it. And then a different kind of an airplane. <clears throat> Try it that way. And then that didn't really make it. And so you finally come down to this guy here as the winning bid. And now the project has passed out of the, uh, the DOD and into the industry partner who won the award and who is starting to build a design using uh, model and, and simulation technologies, looking at different ways and different approaches that could be used to implement what this, this partner helped create as the specifications. The, part, the design gets decomposed into smaller and smaller parts the parts uh, have their own parameters about how they operate and you can find out about failure rates and failure nodes and things that don't work very early in the process as we do with simulation and IC. It's the same sort of simulation driven verification but early in the process and early in the architecture. We go and start to design different pieces of it together. We need electrical, we need the airfoil, we need metal, we need to see here are the electronics, right? How hot are they going to get and how do they fit together? So all of this is simulated as you go and all of these pieces of the plane are in the database so that everybody in the project sees all of the parts of the plane uh, fitting together. And so you can see here how you can try different shapes and simulate the stresses on them and come to some early decisions about your design. While this is all going on, the government in its oversight capacity on the secondary path can also look at the design as it's running and uh, come to make sure that the plane is doing is w what it's supposed to be. And so rather than going to a physical plane and opening up and looking at all the pieces and looking at how it fits together, you take this model of a plane and open it up and see how it's put together, what all the pieces are, what they cost, do they meet the requirements that you have for your project. Um, you get into you know, much broader sets of, um, of, of parameters that you can look at, see how it's structured. The plane is essentially built in a virtual space, and then you can, in that virtual space, take the plane, take some of the parts off, look inside, see what's what. And so this is all being done by the government uh, in the process of, uh, of, of doing it. You can even look at manufacturing techniques that might possibly be used 
uh, and simulate like a drill and how would a drill be used to put this part together, this um, wheel actuator. Now that the design is inspected and approved, we can get into more detailed simulation. You know, in this case, we have a, the landing gear system. And we see how the wheel comes up and how it pulls in. Uh, so we can look all through the plane and simulate different elements of it. This is where IC design comes in. Our simulation models would fit into this part of the process. Uh, in addition to these that are looking at the heat we're generating, the, heat, the batteries, the airflow, how that's all going to fit together. Now that you have the plane designed and ready to go, you're going to think about how to manufacture it. And so you have the manufacturing flow where you see how the pieces will fit and also how you create the instructions for how to make it. So that as you're simulating, you're also creating instructions, following the cabling, making sure that it all fits, and then seeing the process, the steps, how, what, in what order will we add the parts to this box uh, to get this box ready to be installed in the plane. And so now we can see how this all will fit together and then go on to a factory floor where we can simulate the how quickly we can make the parts, how quickly that they'll be developed, the, that they'll be cranked out. Um, and we also have virtual reality ways of looking at the actual size of the plane if it's being built. And do all the pieces fit together? And can all the tools reach it? And, you know, you may be looking at a design that you thought was going to work, but then you learn, uh-oh, you know, this part of the plane gets crimped over against this part of the plane, and that's not going to work. And so we can get all that done before we actually build a plane. Now that we know how to manufacture the plane, we can go and automate the, the shop floor. How, where are all the planes going to be? How are the parts going to fit together? Uh, how much space does it take? And, and what, will it, what will it be needed? to do this manufacturing. All of this can be uh, simulated in Team Center and all of the specifications about the factory and the actual places that one could build the factory are uploaded into Team Center so that everybody has a common look at the way these parts are going to fit together. Now we've shipped. We're at program delivery and we want to see, well, now that it's out there, how will it be built? You know, the Digital Depot will let us look at where the parts are built, where they're going to be shipped, how far they're going to be shipped, how, what the, what's the path that the, path that the parts are going to follow, is there anything that would get in the way between one plant and the other. All of this is also simulated, so the scope of the simulation is spreading out over the course of the project so that we can make have a more efficient uh, manufacturing system without any surprises such as a tunnel or something that blocks a critical piece from being trucked from one place to another. And then finally, you have a part, you have a plane, it's out there, it's built. And now that the plane is shipped and uh, built and out there, it's going to need service. And we're going to find out that there are parts of the plane that are not working the way we thought that they would, that they are wearing out more quickly, or that there are elements of the way we are describing service for a plane that aren't working in the field. You know, and, and no matter all the simulation you do, it's eventually going to go in the field and someone's going to work at it. But that data is also captured and put back into the system so that it can be wrapped around and improve the next iteration of the plane or improve the parts that we're putting in the plane. Uh, so you can see, for example, this piece, this wheel accentuator, that we're going to see how someone would, would work with that. So if a service tech needs to replace that, that thing, uh, they would, there's where it is. So and you can see on the left here, there's the, um, there's the instructions of how to replace it. And those instructions are being simulated on the right. So again, nothing is left to just trial and error. You make sure that it works. And you keep track of the stats about how all the different parts are doing and what it's costing to, to maintain this plane. So now we've worked through the whole uh, seamless flow. We've had one view of a plane shared by the Department of Defense and industry. Both sides are constantly working with the same model and the model goes through the thread from design and requirements over here 
constantly being improved and worked upon until it ships over here. And this process from here to here, you know, can be as little as 18 months and has been as little as 18 months for a brand new flying platform. Now, how does this affect us? Uh, well, we are down in one of the chips on one of the boards and we're going to start to receive models as requirements. Instead of written requirements, we'll receive a model. Maybe it'll be in system CU TLM, or maybe it'll be in some other kind of a model. And we're going to have to turn that model into a chip, either developing RTL, high-level synthesis, something like that. Or we're going to take our RTL models and we're going to pass them back up into Team Center so that they can be part of higher-level simulation. But in the end, what happens is we take this plane that we conceived of electronically and we find that uh, we've got an actual plane, that the project that we worked on, that, uh, that had low risk and a very fast turnaround because all the parts of the team were able to work together.